All right, the time is 2 p.m. and I will call the March 28, 2023 regular council meeting to order and acknowledge that the City of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Nihuac, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. And we acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. So welcome everyone. Uh, we have nothing on the consent agenda. So the first item, just give me half a second here. The first item that we have is approval of the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting minutes. Councillor Noyan. So I'll move that council approve the minutes of the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting. Thank you. Are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing or hearing any, I will close the motion. Please cast your vote. And that is carried, thank you. The next item we have is delegations. We have no one who has pre-registered, but if anybody wishes to come forward to speak to any one of the um, three items that are on the agenda, this is the point in time. I would invite you to come forward to do so and you would be allowed five minutes. Going once. Going twice. Okay, we will move on to our first presentation, um, Recreation Survey Results. We have uh, Brad Babiak and Rob Park from RC Strategies presenting. So welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Brad Babiak, the City's Director of Culture and Recreation. And joining me today is Rob Parks of RC Strategies. We're here to present the findings of the Indoor Recreation Service Level Review Survey and help answer any questions you may have. So the purpose of this afternoon's presentation is to provide Council with an overview of the findings from the community engagement process which included inputs from residents, community groups providing recreation programs, and community contributors. We'll also share how this work fits into the next steps of the review process. So the indoor service level review process was approved in May, on May 10th, 2022. The review has three sections of work to complete. The first section was examination of the Harbor Pool, which was presented to Council in February. Today's presentation is one, uh, on one of seven pieces of work in Section 2, which will lead to the development of a facility program for the city. And finally, Section 3 will look at what facilities and amenities would offer the most effective and efficient opportunity to deliver that facility program. With that, I'll now turn things over to Mr. Parks to share the results of the engagement. Um, thanks very much. Brad, and uh, maybe just one comment on this particular slide before I advance to the next one and just emphasizing what, uh, what Brad has mentioned about really the component that we're going to speak to today. So um, the slide might look a little bit busy and in some ways that's purposeful uh, just to say that there are a number of different elements of research that we are undertaking as part of this process and really the presentation today is just limited to the engagement, important component, but one component of the broader uh, research plan. Uh, so the findings that I'm going to walk through um, are ones that I believe that you've, you've had a chance to read the report. So really there are three tactics that we employed as part of our engagement process. A household survey, uh, approximately 1,500 responses. We did field a community group survey as well. Um, and then hosted some community contributor meetings. And so what my intent is, is to walk you through briefly uh, the findings from each of those uh, mechanisms. Uh, first one is the household survey. 
as I mentioned, about 1,500 responses. We would consider that representative of city households. Um, certainly, uh, if we had fielded it in a random manner, we'd be able to say we would have a, a margin of error. We didn't. We offered the opportunity for everybody uh, in the community, every household, to participate. Fielded it uh, through January of this year. Uh, we did have it as a coded access survey, so you needed that to get in, and that was one of the control mechanisms that we had utilized. We got those uh, codes distributed through uh, Neighborhood Mail with Canada Post, but we did have some codes that were available if people had misplaced, lost their postcard, maybe they didn't receive it. They could call in and, uh, and receive a code, and we actually did have some hard copies available as well. You can see almost 12,000 postcards distributed with about a 13% response rate, which in some instances has people up in alarm, but I would say that um, for the last uh, number of surveys we've done over the last couple of years, that response rate is dramatically higher than we've seen in any other community. So quick walk through some of the, uh, the pertinent findings. We thought they were worthy of mentioning them here today. So first one was just that I'm presenting today is asking households whether members of their house did uh, use indoor rec facilities or amenities within the city. You can see approximately 80% said that they had used it. So I guess one comment on this is we did hear from 20% of people who uh, participated in the survey who actually weren't using indoor rec facilities. And so to me, in some ways, that would suggest that we got a good um, variety of people who had participated. We didn't just get those who are sort of ardent supporters or ardent users of the facilities. Um, do you use other facilities? So everybody was asked this and you can see almost um, two thirds said that they had. And typically uh, those who said they had are using facilities in your neighboring communities, fair number in Sherwood Park, as well as um, St. Albert and Edmonton. Um, Further, those who said that they did use facilities, so about that 80%, we did ask them about their uh, frequency of use. And you can see that um, Harbor Pool sort of tops the list here. So 75% of those who are using your indoor facilities are using Harbor Pool and so on down the list. Um, satisfaction with facilities. Uh, so a number of, I guess, things really to point out here. So one is um, the not applicable is that red bar. I'm just gonna focus on the, uh, the graph on the left-hand side of this slide. So you'll see that there's 23% of the people here said it wasn't applicable for them to rate the satisfaction of the harbor pool. But you know, of those who did rate the satisfaction um, or were able to, those who said they were very satisfied or satisfied is a pretty low proportion, right? And so of the users of the pool, uh, not great levels of satisfaction. If we compare that, for example, up to the uh, walking track on the right-hand side of the slide, um, you'll see that the levels of satisfaction there are quite a bit higher. Matter of fact, it's about three quarters of the people who could rate it level of satisfaction said, yes, indeed, they were satisfied. Asked a question about um, barriers. Is anything limited to your uh, use of the uh, indoor facilities? And 40% uh, said, yes, there was some limitation to it. So we did then ask about uh, or ask them to identify what some of those barriers are. We did it for certainly the harbor pool and the, uh, the DCC amenities, but also in your report, you'll recall that we had some information there about the arenas as well. Um, so the condition of the facility, just over half uh, spoke about that as being a barrier to their use of the harbor pool and so on down the list. Uh, we did ask uh, people to identify what some improvements or enhancements that they would look for in each of these different amenities, and you can see them through this um, slide here. Lots of text on that, and I do apologize, but we just pulled this right out of the report. Um, if you look through there, so for example, on the walking track, people are looking for uh, uh, a longer track and maybe a little bit wider, removing the short, sharp corners, et cetera, and if you go down to the uh, the Jubilee, um, some enhancements to change rooms. It's a little cold in the building apparently, uh, and so on. In terms of the harbor pool that we've talked about before, um, to all of you here, uh, an enhancement of leisure amenities um, in a larger pool is something that, uh, that came through with the respondents we got. Um, the follow-up to that was, how likely are you to actually visit the pool if 
your improvements were made. Um, and the harbor pool up at the top here, so about two thirds of people are very likely to visit the harbor pool if those improvements get made. And um, so on down the list, you can see the walking track was the other one I pointed out and uh, there's about half who said they would be somewhat or very likely to, to use it if the improvement was made. A uh, couple other questions that councils are typically um, interested in, particularly this graph on the left. When it makes sense, is it important to maintain or upkeep before building new ones? You can see almost three quarters of people agree with that, where it uh, makes financial sense. And then on the right, uh, the importance of developing um, rec facilities all together in one building. And again, uh, about three quarters say that it's important to, uh, to look at doing that. So that was a, a real quick stroll through the, uh, the, the household survey. Wanted to speak briefly now to the community group survey. Um, so you can see nine responses. So the city sent that off, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on our behalf. There were 35 groups who were invited to participate in that survey and, and nine responses fielded sort of from mid-January into February. Um, you can see the perspectives that we got and I'd say probably the largest group of that was, uh, was ICE users. Um, we did ask them about their uh, frequency of use through their season of play and because the numbers were fairly small in terms of that respondent pool, we went with raw numbers and not percentages here and uh, you can have a look. And so I guess the one thing up at the top there, the, um, the, uh, the arena in the Dow Center, so that's the one that really is used by most of those groups that, uh, that had filled out the survey. We did ask them about off-season use as well. We were interested in that, and you'll see some information there. Again, that arena in the Dow shows up as, as used by more of the groups than any of the others. Um, and then levels of satisfaction um, with the facilities. And so um, not lots of dissatisfaction showing through this. And of course, we know that uh, for a lot of these groups, they didn't use a number of these facilities, but uh, the Jubilee, um, somewhat satisfied is sort of that, that bigger pool, a little bit of dissatisfaction there. Um, when we talk to groups, we ask them about their ability to meet their needs. So if we have a group that uh, completes a survey, they are delivering a program to some degree somewhere, and so we asked about that. And you can see that um, one of the, uh, the groups who answered this question, they, they didn't all answer all questions, said it wasn't adequately meeting the needs of their, op, uh, their organization, but for the most part, uh, the facilities are somewhat meeting their needs. Um, and then we did ask about some improvements and enhancements, and so you'll see for the arenas and the harbor pool, uh, some of what they spoke about here. Uh, they had a chance to say if we needed some new facilities in the community, and they talked um, about additional ice. You know, in some ways, for sure, these represent who participated in the survey. So the household one was broadly. Uh, this one really is a representative of those who participated in the survey. Um, similar question in terms of the, um, uh, the importance of maintaining or, or upkeeping, and that makes financial sense. You'll see six of the seven who responded say they that they agreed that it's important to maintain. Um, and then in terms of keeping or developing facilities all into multi-purpose uh, type space, similar to the uh, household one, sort of leaning to having them um, being in uh, sort of in, in collections. And then uh, the last one I wanted to speak to um, briefly are these community contributor meetings. So we had five organizations. The intent with these meetings was to bring in some groups who um, weren't represented through some of those other um, uh, engagement mechanisms. And so we don't have specific user groups delivering programs necessarily here. So you'll see that we've got a couple of uh, sponsors and we have some other groups who maybe represent some of those who aren't traditionally um, involved in some of these activities as fulsomely as some others. And so a number of bullets there about the importance of doing some planning and providing these sorts of facilities and you'll see down uh, towards the bottom of this slide, they have identified some enhancements that uh, they felt were necessary in the uh, aquatic facilities and then just talked about benefits of having these kinds of uh, things at the DCC, but some concerns about location. Um, and then uh, a point about just some overall conclusions. So uh, majority of the households that um, responded um, use indoor facilities in, uh, in the city. And of those who uh, 
respondent. Um, the majority uh, use facilities beyond the city as well, so they're going elsewhere. Uh, majority at high levels of satisfaction and dissatisfaction, but outside of the harbor pool, the top three amenities identified for increased visitation. If improvements were made, were the walking track, the fitness center, and then uh, some of those amenities in the Dow. So um, the harbor pool did, did show up a bit through this for sure, but we did see um, a number of other facilities identified for improvements. Um, last slide on, on conclusions here. Um, and I mean, you can read these for yourself, but uh, when we go down to the bottom here, new pool is at the top of the list for indoor facilities. Um, we did hear from the groups for sure, and, and they were more specific to the arenas, uh, but I think broadly through the um, community contributors meeting and the household survey uh, was really looking at some enhancements to the uh, aqua uh, aquatic facility. In terms of next steps uh, for the review process, um, Culture and Recreation will continue to work with RC Strategies to complete section the rest of Section 2 and then Section 3. Um, as part of Section 2, these engagement findings will be integrated with the additional research RC Strategies is already undertaking with the addition, uh, to develop a facility program for indoor recreation in the city. And that facility program uh, is, we're planning to bring that forward to Council of May or feedback and direction on. And then based on that, we would then look at starting uh, the third phase, which would be concept development about which facilities or amenities would make sense to pursue uh, to deliver that facility program. So with that, we're happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. So typically this one and our next item, two items on the agenda would be um, at a committee of the whole, but our committee of the holes have been fairly full with, with items and, and gone quite lengthy. So um, these two, this item and the next one have been moved to, uh, to the formal meeting. So I will be giving some latitude uh, to treat these two items as committee of the whole items that you can ask questions, uh, provide some feedback, uh, just always keeping uh, in mind um, that other people will have um, information or questions I'll ask. So, so that's just laying the foundation for this item and the next item. All right, Councillor Kelly, you're first. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your report. Um, I'm struggling with this report hard. I'll be honest with you up front. I'd like you to please refer to page two of your report, left-hand column, the paragraph that's in italics that rep that says that the, it, the findings are considered representative of Fort Saskatchewan households. And then in particular, the second sentence. So help me understand what it is you're saying here and why you're saying it the way you did. Um, thank you for the question. And, and through the chair, uh, we didn't field this survey using a uh, random selection methodology. And so uh, maybe I'll just take a moment and explain what that means and then I'll specifically answer your question. We could have fielded this survey uh, using that random sampling technique. So what that would mean is we would randomly identify a number of households in the community and provide them the opportunity to participate in the survey. So you can do that through a number of ways. I mean, I think probably uh, one of the uh, the, the, the methodology that we might be most familiar with is telephone methodology when they do that. So they're not dialing everybody in the phone book. They're not starting at the A's and going their way down. Realize we don't have phone books anymore. They're not doing that. What they do instead is they get a whole collection of phone numbers. They do some randomization and then they start dialing it up. When it comes to mail out, um, you could do a, 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 a randomized kind of approach. And so in this instance, we could have said, hey, we only want to send out X number of postcards and provide X number of codes and, and somewhat do a random sampling and sprinkle some in a certain area of the city and in certain areas of other parts of the city. We didn't do that. Because we didn't do that, um, that speaks to the, uh, the margin of error statement um, that is in the, uh, the italicized there. So really in terms of survey methodology, 
you can't really say that you have a margin of error unless you fielded it using that randomized um, sampling technique. So we didn't do that, so we can't say that. The comment in there, though, is saying with the number of responses that we did get, that 1,509, if we had done that randomly and have collected that number of responses, we would say that margin of error is within that. I think it's 2.5%. Uh, so maybe I'll just take a moment and speak about what that margin of error means. That margin of error means that the findings that you would have are going to fall into that plus or minus 2.5%, 19 times out of 20. So if we had, let's just pretend for a minute and just to let me um, to make the point. If we had fielded the survey using a randomized sampling technique, and then we fielded it 19 more or 20 more times, the findings that we have in the report would be within that 2.5% on 19 of those occasions. The 20th time might have been completely different. So we didn't field it using a random sampling uh, methodology. We wanted to provide the opportunity for as many people, as many households in the city to participate as possible. So that's why we've talked about the... Um, uh, the, the margin of error if we had filled it that way. In terms of us saying that it's representative of um, households in the city, a couple things on that. One, um, we, we looked at who participated in this survey in terms of household composition. And while we did find that our sample has maybe a little bit of a, a larger proportion of uh, younger people, uh, families with younger kids than your overall population. The numbers are very close, and I think with the size of the sample, that those two things together had us say, we think these findings are representative of your broader city. So I recognize that that's a longer response than you want it probably and that you bargained for, but I felt it was important to kind of speak to what some of those comments mean. Um. But the point is that this, this survey, and in particular, the sample that we're working with, is not random. Yes, sir. Is that correct? It is not. Uh, it is not randomly sampled. Yes. And if it's not randomly sampled, then you as a consultant or any statistician cannot say that there's a margin of error or purport that there's a margin of error or suggest that there could be a margin of error if we'd have done it a different way. The fact is it's not random, so there is no margin of error. And I'm struggling with why you put that in there. And I'd like you to address that specifically because I think, and I'll be honest, it feels to me like you're trying to give the casual reader an extra sense of security that does not exist. Please tell me I'm wrong and why. Um, so through the through the chair, that definitely is not the intent of putting that in there. the The intent of putting that statement in there is to speak about the significant size of the sample. So there's a couple of things about uh, when that information comes in. So one, as the information comes in. Um, it, we don't get all of the people who love the uh, Jubilee Rec Center providing a response all at the same time. The responses come in in a random manner. We didn't sample this randomly, but the responses that we get do come in in a random manner, which means that of the 1,500 we have and of the responses that we ended up getting, where we were at after we had several hundred responses is essentially where we landed at the end of this. So in other words, after several hundred responses, so we could say 300 or 400 responses, um, how our graphs are presented in here are very similar to what they um, were after that first 400. So the findings come in, the responses come in in a random manner. So while we didn't sample randomly, um, the information that we got, I believe, does represent the broader community. And I guess I would say that um, the other question and, and the flip side to that is, are the responses that we didn't get dramatically different than this? We'll never know. But I would, I would um, postulate that they aren't any different. Okay, perfect. So 
briefly, and this will be my last question for now, Mayor Catcher, briefly for council, tell us please what confidence we have in this, because I'm hearing you say we have a high level of confidence or should have a high level of confidence in the findings of this report. Um, through the chair, I have a high level of confidence in these findings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Blizzard, you're next. Well, thank you, Councillor uh, Kelly, for those questions, or that question, because that was going to be one of mine. Um, and I do agree, It's I feel comfortable with results. It was a good survey, very interesting. Um, some of the interesting things I found was 75% of the population that answered this used the pool. Um, that's higher than I expected. 80% use any of the various facilities, um, and only 26% are satisfied with the pool. Um, I'm not surprised with any of those numbers, but very interesting going all through it, all the reading, the stats. I guess I like stats. Um, but I found one little thing, and this is more for on the leisure side and serving our customers, who are the citizens. Um, the leisure guide, I think it said, it said in there, 50% prefer a print version. And I know a number of years ago, they went out of print on it and just decided to do online. And they found registrations dropped significantly. So after that, they went back to a print format. How's our registrations for any of the programs? Should we be looking at at least, to me, having some available? Because I, I, I myself prefer having a guide where I can circle, here's where I want to go to. I see the value in saving paper, but maybe we need to make sure the people that want to have a print version can have one. You're on, Mr. Babiak. <laughs> Thank you. I just noticed that. My apologies. Uh, to the chair, through the chair to Councillor Blizzard. Yes, we actually do uh, print off some copies and leave them at the DCC as well as Harbour Pool for those who like to have the physical copy. Uh, and one of the reasons we wanted to add this question in was to actually get a greater sense of yeah. is there more demand than what we're just providing at the facilities to go back to print. So we'll, we'll take this away and look at those options. Okay. Um, because was your copies that you had, was that just the photocopied stapled together? Yeah, yeah. not as good as having a nice book. Yeah, it was not a, or through your worship to council, but yeah, it was not a professional copy yeah. uh, that we keep in the facilities. Okay. And I think that's all I have. I'm very impressed with the results and that you said that's surprising, you know, the, that we had so many because it sounds like not that many usually respond. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Um, start with uh, the easy questions first. So of the 1,509 respondents, um, the groups you surveyed, were they, um, were they, not, was, were they um, identified as one or as the, whatever number of people um, responded amongst the group? So would that be one amongst the 1,509 or would that be the individuals that were res responded within the group? Um. Uh, through the chair. So the 1,509 represents 1,509 uh, households in the community. And so we asked people to respond considering everybody in their household. So that means that if somebody got it, filled it out, we can't control this. We would hope that they would have had a conversation with their family, so their partner okay, and so, children. So maybe I wasn't clear on my question. So like, for example, you surveyed um, certain sports groups. Yes. So the sports group, so assuming um, the soccer group, for example, would it be identified as one? Or would it be the individuals within that group? Like five people responded, would that be five? Um, right, sorry about that, um, and, and through the chair. So in that instance, we looked at it as one group. So if we had, I think the number was was nine can't remember offhand now, but I think it was nine groups that we had participate. So that was based on that. So when we asked those groups to participate, we asked them to provide a response on behalf of their organization. And so whether your group has 30 participants or 300 participants, we got one response. So if it was soccer in that example, we, we would hear back and find out that from soccer's perspective, this is how. Okay, that's clear. Think, Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, my second question is just on page eight of your report. Um, so that's why we have um, a graph um, types of use for each facility. And so my question is about the active at home. 
um, so we're comparing with um, we're comparing four different um, categories, right? So Sportsplex, Habopol, GRC, and Active at Home. So if I looked at that graph and I look at 36% of those active at home um, um, drop in, right, they do drop in recreation, wouldn't that number already be captured in those three already? Because active at home are people that don't go to, you get what I mean? They're active at home. So wouldn't that number already be captured in the, the previous three? Um, so through the chair, and I, I understand uh, the question and maybe some of the complexities with this. Um, you know, if somebody is doing a little bit of physiotherapy at home, I can um, understand how people might be doing different activities there. So active at home, the, that first yellow bar, that 36% just talks about drop-in recreation and sport and fun. And so part of the challenge with this is just us fielding this questionnaire broadly and having these number of categories. But what we're trying to find out here and what this uh, graph is communicating is of the people who are actually doing something at home, 36% of them are, are doing that activity at home solely for a kind of a recreation or fun reason. They're not doing it for a rehab purpose. And so for myself, um, if I use that as the example, there's some activities that I'm doing at home that I'm doing solely just for recreation purposes. There's other activities that I'm doing because my physiotherapist told me to do them. And so that would be more on that rehabilitation. In terms of registered programs, just to speak to that, we know that people at home are connected up to the internet and they're actually taking part in spin classes or yoga classes online. And so that could be part of that registered program. So you're saying that all that all these numbers on the active at home, they're, they're doing it at home. They're not coming to our facilities. Correct. Correct. Interesting. And so where are they dropping in? It, it just um, doesn't... Yeah, the, the, the drop-in part um, might be a little bit confusing for they're doing it at home, but the way I would look at that is if they're at home, um, they're just doing some recreation sport just for fun. That drop-in, it fits a little bit better, the drop-in, if they're looking at facilities, but in this instance here, um, when we say drop-in on that part for the active at home, it's really referring to them just doing some activities spontaneously at home just for, for fun or recreation. Okay, thank you. Is that two? Oh, that's three. <laughs> Almost four. <laughs> Borderline. <laughs> Councillor Noyan, I have, a, I have difficulty as some of them kind of blend over. <laughs> Councillor Noyan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm also struggling a little bit with uh, some inferences that were made from this data. Um, I think it's uh, it's graph five, frequency of use visitation by host members. And and you mentioned this. You don't have to reference it. It's just a general detail that I'm that, that I'm looking at. But it, you're you're concluding essentially that 75% of the respondents of the survey um, use the use the harbor pool. Uh, I struggle with this because in, in the graph as well for harbor pool use, 27% use it a few times a year. And given that this is a household survey, that could be uh, potentially a parent saying that our children might use that once or twice a year. And that 27% is a significant number when you consider 75%, when you're drawing the conclusion that 75% of respondents use that pool. So can you just speak to like that conclusion, why, why you've, why you've drawn that conclusion as, as relevant and important in this presentation. Yeah, um, thank you. And through the chair, um, just to take a step back. So we did fill the surveys we've spoken about on a household basis. And so if you have four people in your household, if one of the people had used the pool um, a few times a year, you would check that column. If all of you use the pool a few times a year, you, you check that column. And so there, there for sure is um, a, a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say wiggle, wiggle room in there, but there is some interpretation of the findings. None of the survey work is um, bulletproof. There's a myriad of ways you can do it, and every way that you do it, there is some level of interpretation with the findings. And so I think the message when I look at this information, and I'm, I'm just looking at this particular graph myself, when I look at that, I, I see a number of things. One is 
a lot of people in the community, a lot of households use the, um, the harbour pool. And when I look at that in comparison to those other facilities that have been identified on there, the harbour pool really is kind of that facility that's used by more than anybody else. When I start looking in to some of those uh, findings that you've spoken about, I see that, you know, of the people who are, are using it, there's about a quarter of them that are using it on occasion, I would say, and we've called it a few times a year here. And then there's greater use uh, along the way. And so that's how I'm looking and interpreting that is there's a, a significant proportion of your community. And so if I look at the left side of that bar, uh, daily is 6% and weekly is 21%. You know, you've got about a quarter of your um, households who have said that there's somebody in there using it weekly or more. And about that quarter, that 27% a few times a year. And so when I look at that uh, information in that regard, I'm not so much as getting a specific number of number of visits specific to that. We can get that information from uh, from administration when they look at it. Instead, I'm getting a sense on um, just the, I guess, the proportion of households that are using it and and giving me some insight into how broadly it's it's used by the community. Thank you, and I appreciate that answer. It, is it worth extrapolating this or, or further calculating this data to be more representative then? Is you, do you think? Like, I, I appreciate uh, what, what you're saying, the subjectivity of of the, the findings as well and, and the interpretation of it, but is, is, there, is, is there more work that could be done on this data? Um, through the chair, I suppose in some ways there's there's always more work you can do to dive into the data, but there becomes the law of diminishing returns. What is the value that you would get from that additional information? And for our purposes, this information that we have, um, I guess, fills the need that we, we have for it. Okay, thank through you. Your worship, I'd just like to add one more point. Um, so to the point about the deeper dive. On page seven of the report, it does start to go into a little more depth about looking at that amenity and what were the right. proportion of households that actually used the harbor pool. So for example, at the top of the page, um, you saw that of the people who responded, children zero to nine in the household, 90% of them utilize the harbor pool. Um, and so you also see a similar number with children 10 to 19 in the household. They, again, were going to be more likely to use the harbor pool than if you had no children in your household because then the numbers dropped to 62%. Right. So there is some further breakdown based on demographics that were done here, but it's also possible to do them further. Uh, and part of that, Mark, we would potentially look at when we look at our utilization statistics. So again, this is the next step in the process to make sure things mirror up again to ensure that representation piece, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please come back to me. Okay. So uh, the question that I have is, um, so on the survey, I can't remember if it had uh, the age categories, for, you know, or it's just straight the household. And I, and I asked this question because the survey results when you, um, obviously it had some of that on there, but um, we're a very young community. So, I mean, I think they say over 50% of the people here are 35 or younger. So um, how do you feel that makes an impact on, on the recreation questions? I can share them on here. Um, the, uh, the age of the, so maybe a, a general comment and then I'll, I'll speak specific to that. Um, the age composition of a community is an important thing to understand when you're planning for rec facilities. And um, so if we looked at two ends of a spectrum, one community is really young, which you're saying Fort Saskatchewan's a young community, you know, that would have some impact as a planner on what you might want to put in that community or what you might support, which is different than a community that uh, is aging. The same goes for a community that's growing versus a community that's stagnant. So that's kind of a general comment. So it is important. Uh, in this particular instance, and that was one of the reasons that we did look at it. So we asked through this household survey for people to identify uh, the numbers of people within their household that fall within certain age groups. And so we took that information and we looked at how that compared to uh, the census information for the city of Fort Saskatchewan. And what we found is there was, um, I think, fairly close alignment. 
the sample that we gathered through um, our survey actually leaned and tended to a little bit younger than, uh, than what your city actually is, but it's fairly similar. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, Your Honor. No, I, th I think that does. And then the second question, there was a fairly significant amount that said they just go elsewhere um, to use other facilities. I guess, I mean, there's no comments that are placed into this, but I guess, you know, is there some overall comments that were, were placed within the survey as to the reasons why? Um, we... Um, so, Your Honor, we, we did, um, I guess, learn a little bit about that through even some of the other mechanisms. So, some of the other facilities in some other communities offer, I guess, a different service than is available here in Fort Saskatchewan. Um, so, I'm just thinking about the uh, community contributor meeting. So, we did hear that. Uh, there were some of those folks who went to some other facilities, in particular aquatics, because they were able to uh, get different amenities somewhere else than they could at the harbor pool. Um, from the community group survey, we, uh, we found out that some groups are leaving the community just to try and get access, in particular, to ICE. So they're getting some of that here, but, you know, they have an appetite for more and they're, and they're going elsewhere for that. And so... Um, I would say that some of those people that are leaving the, the community um, are likely doing so to get some other uh, experience in other places, but not everybody who's leaving the community is ignoring everything that goes on here. And so I guess my point is, is there are people that are using the facilities here and they're using facilities elsewhere. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Harris next. Um, a couple of questions. Um, I use the uh, Dowson Tennis Center frequently, um, and I need my memory refreshed. What is the A to B Wellness Studio? Is that the little room behind the judo facility where they have seniors drop in fitness quite often, and whatnot? What 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 is that? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris. So when you go into the lobby. Uh, on the right side, instead of going in the soccer, you go straight ahead. That is the fitness and wellness center. Which where, is also referenced as the synergy, which, which is what I know it as, the synergy wellness okay, center. Make sure I'm not butchering that. Sorry. Yes, that is part of that space. Oh, okay. Fair just enough. Sure. And then the O'Sable Flex Hall, is that the area in the back, in behind? And you're nodding, I understand? Okay. So <laughs> what, that, what that says to me, we've got a very low percentage of use in those two uh, spaces, which I don't necessarily think is indicative of anything other than it's not well publicized or well, well um, marketed. Um, would, would, would that be a reasonable um, feeling that, uh, that those two areas are not well used because they're not well marketed? Through your worship to Councillor Harris, that may be one piece. Uh, the other part is just looking at how we program the space to see if there's something that might be more attractive. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're going to look at in further looking at the survey data to see if there's we can flesh some of those things out. In more yeah, detail. yeah, that, that's good. Um, just the, my last question yep. is. Uh, uh, Councillor Harris, uh, Mr. Fleming was going to jump in and answer something. I was, I was just going to add, like spaces like that are actually sort of programmed. They're programmable and bookable spaces. They're not generally drop in use. So you might not get as. Um, as many people using them because they're more specialty spaces, right? You would put classes in there. The judo club, I believe, occupies the one space most of the time. Um, so they're not, they're sort of more specialty spaces than, than broad public access. That's what, and that would be reflected in the usage numbers. Yeah, I would agree with you. In the past, that was the case, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's the current situation. But anyways, I'm, I'm glad to see you're going to look at that. That's, that's important. The other, my last question was, respecting the fact that uh, we do have a large number of people that use the Dow Center that don't live in the community, how do we get their input relative to things that they feel are important? Because 
I talk to people every day, uh, quite a few of them from Bruderheim or from uh, Sturgeon County, even the, even Strathcona County. And uh, they've all got things to say about what they like or don't like and, and whatnot. How do, how do you capture that data from that group of people so that it can help us move forward? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Harris, we've started to undertake uh, more frequent uh, set client customer feedback surveys in the facility. So that's one of the ways that we hope to capture some of that moving forward is to see with our programs and those other things to actually engage the folks in our facility at that time, to your point, because that will be wherever they're from, they'll have an opportunity to provide feedback versus this mechanism, which was targeted to our residents. Yeah, and, and that's great. Thanks for that response. Okay, we're back to top of order, Councillor Kelly. Thank you again. The actual survey itself, the methodology, the user groups, were they surveyed at the same time concurrently with the population at large, the community at large? Um, through the chair, the, uh, we, we staggered the fielding of the group survey. Um, so the resident survey went into field first. And then after that had been in field, I believe it was a couple of weeks, um, we then, you have it here, Brad, uh, we then extended invitations to that uh, 35 groups to participate in that survey. Okay, so, but the survey, the, the community survey was still open when you were talking to the groups? Yes, it was. Perfect, so it was concurrent then. Um, in your opinion, when you look at survey results, would it make sense typically to see that those people that have the most interest in a subject, in this case, probably the users of the facilities, would be the ones that would be more likely to respond to our request for a survey response? Um, through the chair. Probably a, a fair assumption. I, I think when I, um, and I mentioned it when I quickly skated through the findings from that, that we did hear from approximately 20, I think it was 20% of, of people who responded to the survey who don't use um, the indoor rec facilities in the city here. So I thought that was a, an interesting finding. And in my mind, that spoke highly to people's willingness to participate in there and that we didn't solely get people that, um, are only proponents of the facilities. But um, I, I think that there's usually two groups that you get out um, to participate in surveys, those who are ardent supporters and those who are strong opponents. And I think we got um, a range of people that participated in this. But I think to your point, you know, people are going to participate in a survey that they have an interest in. Through your worship Thanks. to Councillor Kelly, sorry, I just add one additional point. We we recognize that obviously may be um, something since there was a long a lot of interest in the harbor pool that may come up. So we actively tried to work to promote um, no, specifically target non-users uh, through uh, our media conversation with the Fort Sask online. They specifically quoted that it was th that we were trying to reach out to both users and non-users to understand you know, if you're a user, what your level of satisfaction is. And if you weren't, why you chose not to. Uh, we also pushed that in our social media as well to, again, try and make sure that it was, try and clean, communicate as clearly as possible. We really did want the broadest range of input from the community. And I'm not saying that you didn't. That's not really not my point. Um, I think the comment that was made by the consultant that you tend to get responses from the polar extremes, I think that makes some sense. Uh, you're going to get strong results from those that use the facility and perhaps strong results from those that are opposed to anything. But that is the extremes on the ends of the scale and, and the missing middle, I think, is very large. Um, I'm going to have more questions on this, but I'm just going to put this seat out that I've lived in this community for forever. It is my home. There is no possible way that 75% of the community 
uses Harbor Pool. It's not, it's not in the realm of possible. And that's why I struggle with this. I know people use it. It's not possible that it's 75% of the community. It's 75% of the respondents, which is primarily the user groups. And I'm going to continue. Thank you. Um, excuse me, Your Worship. May I comment on, on that? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the question about utilization, uh, and it spoke about 75% of the people that had used it. That 75% is of people who said they utilize rec facilities, indoor rec facilities within Fort Saskatchewan. So we asked that question up front, do you use indoor rec facilities in Fort Saskatchewan? And it was, I think 80% said that they did. That group was then asked, how often do you use these facilities? 25% of that group, I'm gonna try not confuse everybody here, 25% of that group said that they did not use the pool. So 75% of the 80% use the Fort Saskatchewan pool. So if I take a step back, that means that 60% of households in our survey said they use the Harbor pool. And, and, and I got, I think this is important. You say, and referenced in your overhead slide at the beginning, 75% of the respondents. In the report, for instance, in the executive summary, the report that is going to be and probably is public information, you don't say that you don't have the qualification. You say in the bullet point and page, the executive summary second page, three quarters of households use the harbor pool. It doesn't say three quarters of the respondents. It says three quarters of the households. And I assume in Fort Saskatchewan because that's who we're surveying. So, so I think it's important to be precise in this. And when I asked a question, you're trying to be precise. But when I read the report, it says three quarters of households. I'm telling you that's not accurate. Okay, I'm going to uh, go on. We've got Councillor Abatoye next. Thank you once again. Um, my first question is going to go to Mr. Badiak. Um, as we go ahead in this journey, because I feel like um, what has brought us up to this point is really the issue of getting a new pool versus not getting a new pool. And I feel like this survey doesn't really get us there. So is there a plan to do another community survey to be more specific about the cost, the timeline, about getting a new pool versus staying where we are? Yes, through your worship to Councillor Abatoy. Yes, as part of the third, so as we wrap up um, the third phase and develop those concepts with costing and everything else, one of the options that was approved by Council that we would bring forward to you again at that time was the opportunity to do further community engagement with essentially taking out those concepts then to the community once they were finished. Um, for, so one of the, some of the thinking behind that is in 2021, when there was the priority recreation survey, there were some questions about, you know, would you like a new pool? Here's some estimates. And it said there'd be additional amenities with a couple of examples, but that wasn't truly clear, I think, to, or we have an opportunity to make it clear to residents exactly what the pool, the, like whatever expansion you choose to move forward would, would look like uh, at a more tangible level to get, then get their feedback. So there will certainly be another survey, right? There is because the this obviously of, is not. Sorry, there is the opportunity if council wishes to. Okay. Okay. Um, now to the consultants. Um, page 17 of the survey, of the reports. Um, so it says 72% of the people, the respondents, believe that it is important to maintain or keep our existing indoor facilities before we consider developing new ones. Um, but under the sub-segment analysis, it says that um, households with 60 or older are more likely to strongly agree. So I'm kind of, I don't really understand what the point of that statement is, because if 72% of people that responded agree to the statement, then what, what's the purpose of that statement? Um. Uh, thank you, and, and through the chair, um, we did undertake um, 
a bit of subsegment analysis to just try and understand uh, what the overall results of the survey were a little bit better and according to some different interests. And um, the point of that, some people might be more interested in some of those subsegment findings than others. And um, when we, we spoke a little bit earlier on about, you know, does the age of a community have any input into some planning? And it does. And so you might look at some of the subsegment findings of the survey and consider that. So for example, if you were really concerned um, about how older people in your community viewed a particular subject, you might be interested to know on how they responded to some of these questions. And so um, in this particular instance, um, we looked at strongly agreeing. So the, the respondent households that had somebody 60 years or older were more likely to want to maintain or upkeep. And so what that would suggest is that this particular number, this bar that's on this graph, it represents all the findings. And so if we were to strip out those who were 60 and older, we would see a higher level of strongly agree than there is now. And so um, there's no, I, I guess, I wouldn't say there's any particular agenda. It's just trying to point out some ways and some of the composition of these findings by various age groups. And so you'll see at various points of the report, we presented some of the findings according to if, are there ch young children in your household. You might be interested to know how those households responded. That is different than others. And in this instance, um, when we looked at the findings, we thought, oh, there's a sizable difference between households with somebody 60 years and older and households that didn't have that, that there was a sizable enough difference that it warranted us just presenting it in the report. So some of you might be particularly interested in that. Others might not be that concerned about it, but we just felt that we would share that piece of information. Right. I appreciate that. That's clear to me now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Annoyan. Yeah, thanks. I also have uh, two questions. One will be regarding the survey and then one will be on operation of, of the pool. Uh, so first question, I, I was kind of hoping for with the uh, survey results that we'd have more uh, community groups uh, uh, weigh into the survey. I think that's, that's probably uh, goes without saying. Um, so there's 35 that were approached. Out of those 35, would you say the majority of those were, were like ICE user groups? I, I think just from the list that I saw, and then I started thinking of who, we, who else we have that use our facilities predominantly, I, that, that seemed to be the case. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noy, yeah. The, um, so are you responding to the 30, are you referring to the 35 groups overall or those who responded? Overall, yeah, that's, that were approached. And, and, and also if, if there was any feedback, uh, as in we're, we're perfectly happy with, with our facilities and the way they're run, therefore we don't, we're not submitting any feedback. Through your worship to Councillor Noyant, um, you raise an interesting point because at this time we were also out engaging on the JRC renovation, and of which the thirty a number of the thirty five groups are indeed uh, arena users, mm -hmm. um, because that includes not just our our minor sports, but that's also our spring and summer ice who offer programs and training camps and those types of things. So they were getting uh, heavily engaged um, in twofold. Uh, but when we looked at the results from this with comments on the JRC, they pretty much mirrored what we were hearing through the JR con JRC consultation on the reno or modernization. Uh, so yeah, that's, we did catch some feedback from that process as well. Um, but yeah, you are correct that that is the majority of the users. Okay. Th thank you. I appreciate I, that response. Yeah. And sorry, just to clarify again, this is primarily indoor um, groups, but we did open it up quite broadly for this, just because some outdoor groups do use our indoor facilities for training or other purposes as well, even if the, the sport itself isn't done there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that raises another question in my mind, but I'll leave it there for, for now. Uh, I also wanted to, to ask about some of the, the data in the bar graph on it's page 11 regarding regarding barrier regarding barriers that exist at, at Harbor Pool specifically. Um, so 51% said condition of the facility is a barrier to entry. Facility is too busy, 42%. Hours operation, 41%. Is there a great opportunity here to uh, like immediately look at a potential hybrid model of scheduling our 
our, our pool operations so that it is uh, more accessible to to the public throughout the day and when, when has that been done or trialed last do you know do you know what i mean by that um it, it's mo most pools that, that i'm familiar with they um, you know, they encompass a schedule that's open to the public at all hours. Um, and it, I'm, I'm thinking if a large segment of the respondents on this survey have said that, you know, hours of operation, busyness of the facility issue, can we do something immediately, make an evaluation and, and go forward from there? Through your watership to Councillor Lloyd, absolutely, we can definitely look at our scheduling to see what we're doing. Uh, that said, we are open um a fair number of hours but one of the things that takes place during the day is oftentimes schools will actually uh rent out the space for their own school lessons and so there is other programming throughout the day as well and again with one basin we're limited in terms of what options we can do but we definitely can look at the feedback and looking at what we're currently doing to see if there's areas of improvement so when say when a, a school has booked the facility then they're not booking part of the facility they are booking the entire facility so that segment is is blocked off to the public during those times uh i was just trying to think of, it might be inconsistent yeah. too if, if yeah yeah it would partially depend on how much access in terms of the age of the group uh, again because the pool can only handle lessons for certain ages in certain areas and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's a, a number of different considerations, but I think we've been looking at the schedule the last little while to try and optimize it as much as possible to create that uh, access. Uh, the other piece that just comes to mind um, in terms of some of the things that were actually mentioned here is the timing of certain things don't actually allow when pe align with when people want it. So even if we do have some openings in terms of space, it may not be at the right time for the people who want to actually use the facility, which is not unique to the pool. It is the same issue we have with our arenas as well, is there's the prime 10 hours where kids are out of school, everyone wants to be doing things, and then there's challenges with other parts of the day. Of course, yeah, that's very, very understandable. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go next. So when I read the survey, I went, wow, this is pretty high level. But at the end of the day, it's a reminder to us, you council uh, directed administration to go back and ask for a complete survey of, of all the facilities, right? So it was supposed to be a fairly uh, high level, uh, wholesome one. And so I'll let you answer that one first what was asked for? Uh, to your worship, yes, uh, indeed it was about our aquatics, indoor ice and fitness. It was to meant to address all of those. Okay, so I just wanna be clear on that. So as we talk about that, um, the other thing, so I guess in your opinion, with the survey results that came back in, there were some facilities that really didn't have any any comments on them but I assume because like gymnastics is looked after footballs looked after um, do you anticipate the ones who have the facilities that are 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 working well we're not hearing from them because they're satisfied to your worship I'll just clarify we didn't ask about indoor recreation facilities being operated by other groups so for example to your point gymnastics was not included in the survey nor was the curling club this was about the city ran facilities okay so that's why you may not have seen comments on some of those other facilities okay yeah um I get it all right okay thank you so we're down to Councillor Kelly now go ahead Thank you again. I'd like to refer yourselves and council to page um, 32 of our package, page 19 of the of the report. Um, I think I heard you say that the demographic data that you you were comfortable with the demographic data in it, it represented um, reality within the city of Fort Saskatchewan. When I look at it, I noticed that of the respondents. 51% of the respondents are households with children. And, and I have no problem with that, except that that's double the reality. 26% of the households in Fort Saskatchewan had children, but 51% of the respondents were families, were family or family homes. So, so how does that skew the results, if at all? Um, through the chair, 
The and I, we we talked about this briefly earlier on that the composition of your community has a has an impact in terms of um, planning, right? That there is an impact on that, and I guess you know I've been thinking about this as we've been chatting about this this whole survey and and all the information and even this broader process. The information that we've collected through this survey and all of this engagement, I think, is really good information and I think it's advanced this whole process significantly from where it was at. And so I'm getting to specifically to your, to your question, but um, there is nothing that's completely bulletproof. And even to the last question or a couple of questions ago that, um, that Mr. Babiak answered, um, the information that we collect, and if we were to go out and do this survey or any other surveys again, at the end of this week or in a month, would the information be the same? Pretty sure it wouldn't be the same. Would it be close? I think it would be close. Yeah, I think it would be good, but it wouldn't be the, exactly the same. So it's imperfect information. And so to the question about, you know, the participation of households, um, with a little bit of a younger family, we know through some of that sub-segment analysis that we've presented along the way where um, some sizable differences uh, showed up, that households with younger children had a tendency to respond a little bit differently in some instances than households without children. So there would be some influence to some of those questions. Having said that, and back to my opening comment for this answer, um, you know, we have information here that provided great insight into uh, what respondents had to say that I think provides really good insight into what the community has had to say. And I think that information, along with all of those other pieces of information that we're going to gather, that's illustrated on that uh, graphic, that process graphic that we have up on our screen here now, and that um, was part of the presentation, all of that information will conspire together to allow us to come back and have a solution that we think is appropriate. That solution that we come back with isn't going to be 100% bulletproof as well, but what it will do is it will give you a much more informed position through which you will make the decision. And so, quick answer, if it's younger people that have responded to this or families with younger kids have responded to this, that will give us, um, for sure, in some instances, we've shown a little bit of a different response than if we didn't have many families with younger children. But the error in this, in this sample is more than plus or minus 3%. In fact, it's, it's, it's significant. Um, so a rather lengthy answer, but do you think this sampling could, the, the discrepancy in the sample as compared to the population as a whole, the community, and this is supposed to be a community survey. So do you think that this sample could have influenced, this discrepancy could have influenced the results differently than had we had a rent, um, an authoritative study of the community itself? as a whole, a statistically relevant one is the words I was searching for. Um, through the chair, the findings may have been somewhat different, but they may not have been. So I, I can't be definitive with that. We know that, uh, and what we've seen in here is households with younger children have a tendency in some instances to respond slightly differently than households without younger children in it. Uh, Mayor Catcher, I'm going to ponder that response and get back on the list. Thank you. Okay, I think we're kind of at the end of questions. So if you have one more, go on, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, Mayor Catcher, I've got a Yeah, okay. Um, I've got several questions. So... I wouldn't like to be cut off on this. I might have to continue after the break if you see fit. Um, 
We'll, we'll like finish up the questions and then we'll take the break. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, page nine, pardon me, page, just give me a second. Um, page six of the report. We've touched on this before. I'd just like to go back to it. Um, give me a second to scroll there. Yes, I'm at page six now. That's the um, talking about frequency of use. And, and I know that no survey is bulletproof. Um, but if we look at the frequency of use, and, and I only focused on Harbor Pool, not because I have a bone to pick, but because administration has informed council on a couple of occasions that the annual usage of Harbor Pool, I think, covers around 105,000 visits. So, so plus or minus 1%, it's in that range. If we simply do the arithmetic, the multiplications for the responses given for Harbor Pool, the 6% that use of the community, because this is representative of the community. So if we take the 6%, multiply that by the number of households of 10,400, multiply that by five, and then multiply that by 48 weeks, because the pool is closed for essentially a month per year for, for maintenance, um, that comes out to very close. It's 100 to 150. It's 149,760 visits. So that would tell me that while we're getting a lot of visits in the pool, those visits are predominantly a small portion of the population. Um, let's take this one step further to be fair. If we look at the blue section, um, 21% use it two times per week. And, and I understand it was one or two, but let's, and we can adjust this as you ne see necessary in your mind. But I did the same multiplications just at two times per week. And that comes out to an additional 210,000 visits. So the survey is telling council that 26% of the population in Fort Saskatchewan represents somewhere between 100, 200 and 360,000 visits to the pool. Uh, I'm interested in comments that you might have on that one, please. Um, thank you, and and through the chair. So the the first comment I'll make is, and and we talked about this, and you had pointed out about the uh, the inaccuracy in the executive summary. So the numbers in that particular graph um, were those figures are answers from eighty percent of the um, the population, right? Eighty percent of the uh, community had used it, and so the six percent of the uh, the daily use is six percent of the eighty, and so it's three point six percent. So I'll, I'll say that second comment, and then uh, maybe I'll let uh, maybe Mr. Bagbiak speak to it about some of the utilization information that they're collecting. If two people um, from the uh, the pool had had gone, um, then the households would respond to this and indicate that uh, they would indicate that their household had gone. Once. So if everybody in the family went, they wouldn't count that as four times. They would count that as a household went on one visit. Um, so, Mr. Baviak, I'm not sure if you want to comment specifically on how uh, utilization is collected for the pool. Uh, to, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, yes. Uh, I think we're kind of getting into the, the next phase of the work where we're going to actually take the utilization statistics we have from the various facilities uh, and corp and use that as part of this work. Um, but yeah, that so that would for the pool for in this example, the numbers would include, uh, and I don't have the annual visitation right in front of me, but the drop in lessons, um, and I'm trying to think about rentals right now. Uh, that may not be included fully uh, in there, uh, depending on whether or not we track. While we track the rentals, I do believe we have to look at lifeguards based on the capacity. So there might be some of that as well, but I'd have to follow up to get uh, greater detail on that data 
to kind of speak more specifically to this. I think it's important to note that this is 6% of households. Um, and it's certainly clear that more than one member of the household could go to the pool. Um, and, and in fact, that's entirely possible. But the population of Fort Saskatchewan is over 27,000. It's in fact 2.6 times the number of households. So if we're going to look at households, then we look at households. If we're going to try to extrapolate that to population, then we should do use individual numbers, not household numbers. And it's 6% of households. That's the numbers we were given. 149,000 visits. There's, 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 a, there's a concentration of use in the community for this pool, apparently. Um, and I need, we, council needs, I think, to come to grips with that. Mayor Catcher, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more. Is there anybody else on the queue? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. My disappointment with this survey is that when council was approached, I read the proposal. I was of the understanding that it would be a community survey. And I think the numbers are the obviously biased enough and the process biased enough to allow council to safely conclude that we got a great survey, but what we really got was a survey of the user groups, of the users and the user groups, not a community survey. And, and that is my absolute frustration with this. It's clearly not a community survey. The process doesn't eliminate bias. And there's, if you gave me 10 minutes, I could list 20 different biases built into this survey. Um, and the results of the bias surface when we look at things like reported usage, um, it's wildly in excess of what actual usage is. The bias shows up when we look at the demographics and who, who made up the lion's share of the responses. And not that families shouldn't be heard, that's not my point, but a community survey means we hear from everybody equally. And not one portion of the community gets double the representation. Uh, so, so the bias is, is evident and rampant. Um, the data, I think, shows that clearly. And I would like administration to give some consideration to coming back to council. And if necessary, I'll put a notice of motion forward on this to, uh, to come back with a plan that gives us a survey that's more authoritative and more reliable than the one we're looking at right now. It, thank you. And I'll cut it off there, Mayor Catcher. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I would like to uh, thank Brad and uh, Rob very much for being here today to present this and bringing the information that was requested for these specific facilities. I did miss that myself. Um, so thank you very much. I think it gives us a good tool to work with going forward. And with that, we are going to take a 10-minute break. So it's 3.18. My clock is gone. Till 3.30. We'll resume. Thank you.
All right, we will resume the meeting. And uh, the next item on the agenda is 5.2, Municipal Development Plan Implementation, uh, two-year report. And once again, uh, this one will be treated as a committee of the whole item so that uh, we can provide information and feedback to administration. All right, so welcome, Lindsay and Craig. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Lindsay Francis, the senior planner here at the city. And with me today is Craig, our director of planning and development. And I'm going to present the first biannual update on the progress of the municipal development plan implementation. So first, I'll give a little bit of background, and then we'll get into the municipal development plan implementation targets, the planning and capital infrastructure projects, some population and housing statistics, and then questions. So as Council's pretty familiar with, the city adopted a new municipal development plan in January of 2021. Within both the strategic plan and the MDP itself, there's direction to work on the implementation of the MDP. Specifically, the MDP includes the following policy. The city will monitor the MDP implementation targets every two years and report to Council and the public on the progress towards the targets. So the reason we wanted to bring this forward every two years is to make sure it's not a plan that just sits on the shelf and that the city is taking actions to achieve the visions and goals within the MDP. So just as a reminder, the vision within our MDP is as follows. With 50,000 residents, our community of Fort Saskatchewan provides a great quality of life within our neighborhoods where everyone can grow, age, and stay builds on its heritage, connects people, and fosters innovation, creates great places for residents and visitors to enjoy, and supports a resilient economy for everyone to achieve and thrive. So first, we'll look at some of the highlights from Section 12 of the MDP, which outlines 13 different implementation targets to measure and monitor the plan. And these targets should be achieved by the time the city welcomes its 50,000th resident, so as such, these targets are to be achieved over the next couple of decades or the lifespan of the MDP. So to support the vitality of businesses and enhance the liveliness of downtown, the MDP has an objective to intensify the downtown core and 99 Ave corridor to a density of about 100 plus dwelling units per net residential hectare. And since the adoption of the MDP, we saw some minor increases in density in this area, but not a whole lot has changed. And this is because in terms of implementing the MDP, there haven't been changes made to policy or regulation yet. So another target in the MDP is about increasing dwelling units and population within the established neighborhoods. So while there has been the development of the Heartland Housing Project, which brought 83 new dwelling units to the area, the population within the established neighborhoods has decreased by 1.91% since 2017. So this means that more units have been added, but the percentage of the total population within the established areas are decreasing. We also have a target that's about the existing neighborhood nodes intensifying and new nodes being developed to a density of 60 dwelling units per net residential hectare or above. And we did notice there was one error in this part of the report due to the densities, including some commercial land in their calculations. So now I'll share the correct node changes in density. Uh, this first node down here um, had a decrease in density due to the development of a townhouse complex. So it went from 120 to 92.9 dwelling units per net residential hectare. The second node over here had no density before and then now it has had the development of a 126 unit seniors living facility and that brings it to a density of 85 dwelling units per net residential hectare. Uh, this third node had no change in density and is at 71.4 dwelling units. 
and the fourth node has approved development that will decrease density uh, just slightly. This one was from 64.7 to 62.2. .2. And then lastly, the fifth node, this is where that Heartland housing project went and it brings the, increases the density from 74.1 to 92.4. So there were two nodes that had a decrease in density due to some town housing development uh, being built next to some existing higher density development. So both of these nodes still remain above the 60 dwelling unit target. And we also wanted to measure transit ridership and if it outgrows population growth. And that's so that we can tell if more people are taking transit, not just related to there being more people within the city. So you'll see on this slide in the next slide that transit ridership has decreased during the onset of the pandemic and is now returning to pre-pandemic levels. So this graph is the local transit trips. And this graph is the commuter transit trips. And at this time, transit ridership is not outpacing population growth. So those are some of the highlights from the implementation targets. There's a few other targets within the MDP that can't be tracked yet until we do some of the implementation projects. So now we'll look at the projects. And these are within section 13 of the MDP. So there are 32 implementation projects that are included within the MDP. And to date, six of them have been completed. And an additional nine projects have had progress made on them. So the projects that have been completed include uh, develop transit service standards, develop terms of reference documents for the preparation of new area structure plans, develop a downtown strategic action plan, develop a retail and office space inventory and analysis, enhance the city's risk profile through the inclusion of cumulative and compounding use base risks to inform the municipal emergency plan hazard assessment and risk identification process, and develop a foreign direct investment strategy. So as part of the MDP, we also did some population and housing statistics that were gathered. And at the time of the MDP, this was using 2016, 2017 data. So we've now updated those statistics to 2019, 2022 data, whichever was the most up to date that we could find. So the total population within the city in 2017 was 25,533. And in 2019, the population grown to 26,942. The percentage of the total population living within the established neighborhoods declined by 1.91%, while the percentage of the total population living within the developing neighborhoods increased by 3.72%. And South Fort is the neighborhood that saw the largest increase. So this was a 3.87% increase of the total population. And Pineview saw the largest decrease and this decrease was 1.41%. The populations within West Park, Downtown, Sheridan and Clover Park remain stable. So while the city is seeing uh, increased population in our newer neighborhoods, as they continue to grow, these developing areas are attracting new residents and shifting population centers. So they are remaining disproportionately uh, populated by youth and children, while the established neighborhoods are remaining disproportionately populated by older adults and seniors. This next graph shows the population change trends from 2003 to 2019 and trends within the established neighborhoods are continuing. Most established neighborhoods continue to see population decline with Sheridan being the exception. So since 2015, the portion of one and two person households has grown by 0.8%. And that is 59% of households with two person households being the most common. The average household size in Fort Saskatchewan has remained largely stable at 2.6 since the adoption of the MDP. And households with three or four people remained relatively stable. 
Uh, there was an increase in the percentage of five plus person households. However, this is likely largely due to the elimination of the six plus person category. More than 69% uh, of homes within Fort Saskatchewan are single detached dwellings, which is more than the percentage of Albertans living in single detached dwellings, which is 69 point, or 61.9%. The percentage of homes that are detached slightly increased since 2016, and condominiums and duplexes are taking a decreasing percentage of the housing stock. So this means that we're building more single detached housing. So what does all this mean for affordability? So first let's look at home ownership. Purchasing a home has become less affordable since 2017 in all housing types except for condos. So the average single detached dwelling is unaffordable to 44.2% of households. This means that single detached dwellings are affordable to 3.3% less of the population. And the average condo is unaffordable to 18.6% of households. And this, this means that condos are affordable to 2.2% more of the population. So since we've, the development that we've seen in the city since 2017 has an increased percentage of single detached dwellings and they are becoming less affordable, that means a larger portion of the housing in the city is less affordable. Additionally, we've got the 59% of households being one or two person households. So single detached dwellings are providing more space than many households need. And it's at a cost that's greater than 44.2% of households can afford. So now we'll look at rental properties. So bachelor apartments, the rents for those have increased by 10%. One bedroom apartments have stayed stable. There's actually a slight decrease in the two bedroom apartment rents. And there was a 20% increase in the rents for a two bedroom row house. Lastly, a 5% increase in the rent for a three bedroom row house. And additionally, 5.66% of households cannot afford bachelor apartments. And this is an increase from 4.28% in 2017. So administration will continue to report biannually on the implementation of the MDP. And now we can take any questions. Great, thank you. I'm going to jump in here first. Um, so as I read this report, and I have some more questions that are written down there, but when we talk about the existing neighborhoods and the fact that we have some areas that, you know, um, the population is going down, um, and because you have primarily uh, older people maybe in them, not, not even older, but I'm going to say empty nesters going upwards, um, what's the option, you know, as planning is looking, you know, like where, where would they consider even moving to within, within Fort Saskatchewan? Because I know I have this conversation a lot right now. I've got a senior in my house that there's, you know, very limited place for her to go. But people who are thinking about downsizing, what, what, what are the options or the thoughts on that? Well, uh, as you can see, like we are having that increased single detached dwelling. So uh, one of the goals within the MDP is about having more options for different dwellings. And that could include downsizing options as well. So I think we, the sort of answer to that is trying to get all uh, the different variety of housing within the city. Anything, Craig? Uh, Your Worship, I don't think I would add too much to that, but I think just some of the goals that are set out within the MDP are, are around housing diversity, so not only in the developing areas, but also in the new areas as well. Um, so that will bring in younger families, um, particularly if we're looking at ways to, to uh, incorporate infill uh, in the established neighbourhoods. Um, so you raise a good question about um, the older established neighborhoods being households with um, maybe em empty nesters. Um, 
that will you know that will evolve and there will be housing choices for for that demographic as well speaking of households um but um but yeah i think the goals are that we're looking at ways to bring in a diversity of housing which will even out the uh age within all neighborhoods Okay. Uh, second question. When you talked about the density, so the uh, points west, the seniors living, and the um, 83 unit, so they increased the density, but there's actually no population in them right now. So as you review this going forward, that should change the numbers significantly, shouldn't it? Uh, so the density is calculated by dwelling units per net residential hectare. So when people move in or not, that's not going to change the density specifically. Okay, but it would change the population in that area. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so what may be down right now once they fill up could go up. Yeah, okay. and th yeah, and that's what part of the monitoring it every two years to see the changes. Okay, and I'm going to take the uh, luxury of a third question. 12.1.7 neighborhood nodes in the future urban area are developed at or above 70 dwelling units for the entire node area. Can you explain that? Because the next one below it talks about the 35 dwelling units per net residential hectare. So can you explain that? Yes. So I'm just going to pull up a different slide here. So when we look at sort of the MDP area, um, the nodes are uh, these sort of areas. And it's talking about the 70 dwelling units would be in the node areas, but overall in the new areas that uh, get developed, the overall density would meet that EMRB 35 dwelling units. But how do you accomplish that at 70 in those node areas? That's what I need to understand. So the nodes would have like your higher density. So maybe your, some of your apartments, some townhousing, those kind of things will, will meet those, the 70 density. We consider 70 as, uh, as a high density within our land use bylaw right now. Okay. I might come back to that one. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't. I just have some specific specific questions um, from page eighty six of our package, page twelve of yours. Um, it's a takeaways from population and housing statistics. Uh, as this, and I think really what it boils down to is is dealing in percentages of total population. As our city continues to expand south of the highway it has to be expected that Pineview, for instance, will have a smaller percentage of total city population. So in real numbers, what are we experiencing in Pineview? So if we're looking at just Pineview specifically, um, this slide that I've pulled up here is the percent change within neighborhoods. So this is just about Pineview on this purple line. So the population in Pineview has been steadily decreasing, not in comparison to the total population of the city. So the only one that has seen an increase between downtown Sheridan, Pineview, and Clover Park is Sheridan. And, okay, I thought that's what that meant. I, I, that, I think that also points out or, or confirms some of the comments that have been made by, by perhaps Mayor Catcher and yourself in responding. Uh, as the population, the people within the community cycle, and we're all getting older and, and, and we all go through life changes, but I think Sheridan is probably an example of a section in the city that is starting to cycle again to perhaps younger families as, as the homes become available. Does that, is, does that make sense to you? Yes, that makes sense to me. That's what I, I would think would be happening there. So to take it one step further, we could expect to see the same in Pineview probably in another 15 to 20 years. It's about that much newer than, than Sheridan, I think. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if we can just guarantee that it will happen there based on age. It might have to be based on whether there are opportunities um, 
Sheridan in particular has some like lane product that is uh, probably easier to um, redevelop and stuff. So we might have a lot of people going there now. Um, so it, it will depend on not just time, because sometimes neighborhoods could could uh, not, if people are not interested in them, they could just decline as well. So that's why it's important to have our updated land use bylaw and stuff to try to make sure we are getting that neighborhood renewal. And I would agree with that. Thank you. One last quick question. Um, the 83 unit Heartland building, those 83 units are included as part of the Sheridan numbers? Um, the 83 units are, they're just, they're in the node of the old hospital site. Um, through you, your worship, Councillor Kelly. Um, I think your point is, or you might be wondering if the um, the 83 units would contribute to the population increase. So um, I think we have to be careful that, uh, and I, this kind of goes to Mayor Ketcher's point, because um, we haven't seen a population increase, but we have seen an increase in density in terms of the housing units. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. I th thank you, Craig. I think it sort of does. We'll have to wait and see is really what you're telling me. But if, in fact, there are people living in that building in the future, which I know that will happen, will those, part, will those people be counted as part of Sheridan or part of some other portion of Fort Saskatchewan? I don't have the exact um, boundary from the census right now, but I believe it would be in Sheridan. I could, could confirm that later. Um, that's good enough for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is around the um, 13 implementation targets. Um, so 12.1.3, the downtown core and 99 Avenue corridor have intens intensified to 100 plus. So that's the target, right? Um, so I said that you broke them into two different categories. So is, is that a combined target or is that an individual target? Because I, I feel like if combined, that's already over 100 plus. And um, the same question applies to 12.1.6. The target is to be at uh, 60 dwelling units per net hectares. And some of these nodes already have exceeded the 60. So I'm wondering what, what are, what's really is our target? We've already exceeded our target. You get what I mean? So. So for the uh, 99, so they are sort of separate areas in the MDP. So we sort of calculated them separately. Um, yeah, the 100 is the target. Okay, for, for um, downtown core. For the downtown core and, and the 90s. No, okay. So we just sort of calculated them as two independent areas because okay. they're two independent policy areas right. in okay. the MDP. And then for... Yeah, for 12.1.6. Yeah, some of them are already at that, at that target. Um, but it is important to monitor because, like, you saw some of them have had decreases. So we right. want to make sure that they stay uh, at that 60 level or and that the new ones reach the 60. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and my second question is 12.1.12 um, as well as 12.1.13. Um, so the first one is that the health of the urban um, canopy is monitored annually. Um, so it, it kind of feels like the two of them, the targets are not really measurable targets, right? So how do you measure success? Because, okay, um, the target is to have a healthy urban canopy. What does that mean? So I'm just wondering, like, um, it just doesn't feel like it's measurable. So can you tell me how we'll measure success on this target? Um, for this one, we're, as you see, there's no baseline data right now. We are undergoing the Urban Forest Protection and Enhancement Plan, and that's going to give us some data on things like how many trees there are. Um, and then as it's being monitored, we'll know if we're losing trees, gaining trees, um, if they're being, yeah, so things like that will be included within that implementation project and that's going to help us monitor it okay so i guess we have to know where to get the plan first and then when when we know the plan then we can figure out what the goal will be right okay yeah. thank you okay thank you councillor noyan 
Yeah, thanks for the uh, the presentation this afternoon, and it's good to hear the update on the MB MDP. Uh, my first question has to do with our projects, 13 projects, um, or 15 projects, and and one of them that is um, in in progression. I think we have a, a study of the Clover Park area that's going to be done in conjunction with U of A faculty for research or plan planning. I would assume. Um, what. <laughs> What are we looking at gaining from from this? Like, I guess Clover Park, as a community, is is built out. It's bound by by roads, industry. Um, I believe the the jail um, on one side. So, what it, it, is this geographical area? I guess maybe further than Clover Park, or what? What are we looking at here? Uh, so for for that one, it is looking at sort of the quarter section of Clover Park. And right now within the MDP, Clover Park's identified as a special study area to undergo uh, yeah, a study to see how it can sort of move towards our MDP goals if there's any ways. Um, so there might be able to be some intensification in that area or the study might also tell us that it it's uh, it would make sense to sort of leave it as is. So it's just, just sort of investigating that area further. Yeah, interesting. And so that's all a private landowners there. And they, they you know, obviously intensification would entail subdividing and, and things like of that nature is, is what we'd be looking at potentially. That's completely subjective. Your Worship, if, if I could just add to that, what we in the MDP, we found that we didn't we, we were reluctant to really create policy within the Clover Park area. Mm. Uh, in urban municipalities in particular, if you have that type of country residential, um, it's, it's very difficult to know what to do with it. And I think um, many urban municipalities kind of wrestle with having to deal with uh, country residential. So we kind of identified it given that it was kind of a large area. Um, as being something that we can look into further and study it. And so as kind of the first step, um, we didn't want to launch right into a, a full study, um, but we thought to engage with the University of Alberta to do some uh, exploration uh, in terms of what potentially could be doing. So, you know, possible best practices, um, maybe what some other places have done, um, and then look at that information and then make some decisions on how we might go forward. Okay, thank you for that. Would, would Point of Pins Estates then also be considered country residential, or is that is that a different definition? Uh, through you, Worship, I think in, in a sense it is country residential, but it would be more akin to the estates, I think, in, in okay. South Fort, just based on the size right. of the lots, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll have uh, one more question. Okay, we'll... Uh... Keep going. Okay, I'm back on. Um, so uh, when we came to the um, uh, projects and that, uh, one of them is undertake a highway urban design corridor study. So I guess I really have to question that one because on one hand we're told we want to widen the highway to six lanes, three and three. So if we want to do that, then I don't think it would be an urban uh, design corridor anymore. So can you explain what, what you're thinking with that? Um, yes, Your Worship, and I think um, you're, you're right. We'd have to give some, some thought. We do recognize that the Highway 21 and 15 do run through the city. Um, being an, or, you know, and given the context of, uh, I guess the the engineering and the type of road it is, um, how we could look at it from more of an urban design perspective to um, look at things like when you come into the city, you have actually a sense of entry that welcomes drivers when they're going through that they're in Fort Saskatchewan and not just driving through Fort Saskatchewan. Um, we would have to scope out specifically what that project is and uh, and what it would look like. But um, I think it was just identified um, in the MDP because the MDP was more of a place-based, design-based document that looked at kind of urban characteristics. And again, it's um, I think the idea was ensuring that if you're entering the city that you have a sense that you're in the city of Fort Saskatchewan. 
Okay, and I only asked that question because it says it's scheduled for 2024, so uh, that's fairly quick. I expect we'll see it in the budget. And then the next one, develop a downtown River Valley Trailhead and Tourism Center. Uh, do we not already have a tourism center because we used to have one, and then I thought it was moved out to the Dow Centennial Center? So is this creating a second one, or just help explain that one? So I've got... uh, yeah, so I, I believe this one is, yeah, it's kind of seems like it's directly related to looking at it in that area. Um, some of the items in here they've been identified but as we go through implementation we may find as things change that they are not applicable anymore or so it's it's something that we would sort of investigate and see if we'd like to go forward with okay and so as we're looking at this review when are you going to make some decisions if it's still applicable because we're hearing the review we're hearing the information and I'm always questioning because the next review won't come till 2025 and and depending when in 2025 uh, a new council could say oh they're going to do this so uh, when when do you decide that changes should be made I guess that's the big question as we're looking at these it's a good time to review but when do you actually come back and and say yeah we should change that so we could change that with our regular updates to the MDP. So typically you'll review your MDP every five years and uh, you could do some housekeeping at that time and make updates then. Do you wish if I could add on? Where uh, are you? Oh, it's Janelle. Sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> that particular item will be informed by the wayfinding strategy, which is scheduled for 2025. So we may undertake that work and find that uh, this implementation item isn't necessarily a good fit as a result of that work. Um, my understanding of the tourism center was it could be um, as simple as a brochure stand. It was supposed to be something that drew you to a destination and started your journey through the river valley. Um, that is obviously one that we have to scope out a little bit more and get a bit of a better understanding. Uh, but some of the other projects before that one will help inform that work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're up. Thank you. Um, I'm back to where we left off, where I left off page 11 of your, pardon me, page 12 of your report, the takeaways again. Um, I'm looking at the bullet point that says nearly 70% of the total housing stock is single detached, which is more than the per percentage of Albertans at 61.9. Uh, of course, Alberta has the Wales of Calgary and Edmonton in the sample. How do we compare if we look at our peers um, based on more or less a population of mid-sized cities in, in, in Alberta. Can you comment on that? Um, I haven't done any comparison on that, but if that's information you're interested in, I could put that together for you at a later date. And there's no rush, but it, and I don't want you spending a day doing it either. Uh, but if you could give it some thought and if it's easy, it might be informative, at least I think it would be. Um, but I stress if it's easy. Uh, the other bullet point where you reference the affordability of home purchases compared to 2017, is the drop off in affordability due to increased pricing or increased mortgage rates or both? Um, we have definitely seen uh, increased mortgage rates and if I pull up the more detailed um, home ownership affordability slide here yeah you'll see um, that in fact the average assessed value of a detached dwelling not including the estates uh, dwellings it had gone down but the price 
to afford it had gone up. And this is probably due to the interest rates. Yeah, I think that is, it indicates that fairly clearly. Um, so that might, in fact, cycle a little bit better going forward as well. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I've got Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. And just a, a last question. I, I found a little bit alarming the, the percentages of single family homes that are that are becoming more unaffordable uh, for families. There's quite a bit of an, an increase from 2017. And also, if you look at uh, affordable rents as well, like that increase from 4.28% to 5.66%, that's actually a did the math, it's a 32% increase in the number of, of people who cannot afford uh, affordable rentals um, in Fort Saskatchewan. My question has to do with, uh, I guess, the, 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 the steps that we're taking proactively as, as planning and development department. Sorry, my chair just went down here. <laughs> I don't want to... So, uh, so uh, get back on track. Uh, so it's some of the steps that, we're, like, and, and, and conversations that that we're engaging in with developers to ensure that um, they they are looking at providing a single family uh, like product. And I know we've seen quite a bit of this over the last last year and year and a half. Smaller housing housing types like a, like zero lot lines and whatnot. But that that they're actually taking measures to make these types of products more affordable and they're going to be in the, in the next little while. Maybe you can just speak to that a bit. Um, as we start implementing the MDP, uh, we'll be doing it through, especially in new areas, through new area structure plans. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at doing is having some thresholds within our area structure plans that you can only have X percentage of this kind of uh, like low density development kind of thing. So we're, we're trying to get some other options that way. Uh, for the price point, there's not as much that we can do there. If I could just add to that, and I think some of the tools that we have, and really we have only so many tools, but um, as uh, Lindsay pointed out with our new area structure plan, we have a little bit more uh, ability because we're dealing with um, a, a, a basically a, a clean palette, I guess, um, and it come part of it comes down to design. Um, the MDP is is relatively prescriptive when it comes to what new neighborhoods are going to look like. So it does talk about things like a node and distribution of land uses within the neighborhood and layering of densities as well. Um, so there is a little bit more thinking and, and strategies that goes into neighborhood design. Um, so developers are going to have to think about how are they going to incorporate uh, densities that are required within the node area, which would allow for the ability to have um, other densities or lot, maybe even a, a, a different distribution of single detached lots as well. Um, and providing that variety of housing uh, should be able to um, ensure that affordability and prices are in check. Yeah, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it absolutely does, and I appreciate the the consciousness that you, you put into your answer, and it does circle back to some of the same concepts that we discussed. So, yeah, yeah, I look forward to the blank slate that we have here upcoming. Thank you. Great, thank you. So that looks like all of the questions that we have for this one. So I just want to say thank you for all the work that you're doing on this one, um, and and just you know I encourage the public to go on and read the MDP, follow along on the review, uh, because it is going to be critical as the area structure plans come forward, but also when it comes to infill and and just having some of that documented information, I think is really really key for people and. And uh, a lot of people don't understand the MDP is the first document, and then it goes ASB, and then land use bylaw, and then down from there. So I always encourage everybody, um, go on and uh, check out the MDP, and know that our staff and our council are working, uh, do a lot of work on these documents. So I just want to thank you for all your time and energy on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right along to Community Grants Policy Update. Jennifer Hoyer and Brad Babiuk. There we 
There's my notes. Very good. <laughs> okay, welcome. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Jennifer Hoyer. I am the Director of Family and Community Support Services. Here with me today is Brad Babiak, Director of Culture and Recreation Services. We are here today to bring recommendations to Council for amendments to the Grants to Organization Policy and to update Council on amendments made to the procedure to align with the policy. The Grants to Organizations policy and procedure were initially adopted in 2019. The policy was amended in September 2022 to include affordable housing providers as eligible applicants. At this time, administration acknowledged that proposed updates would be brought to Council for consideration in the first quarter of 2023. Administration has made the following revisions to the Grants to Organizations procedure. Eligible organizations has been defined to include nonprofit organizations and affordable housing providers. To accommodate the addition of affordable housing applicants, the Alberta Housing Act has been added to section 4.2.1 of the procedure. In addition to the above revisions, the grants to organizations application will now require a copy of the applicant's most recent annual general meeting minutes. Administration recommends that the Grants to Organizations program allow for multi-year funding up to a three-year term. At the discretion of Council, multi-year funding would be considered for applicants providing an essential service for the residents of Fort Saskatchewan. Essential service has been defined as a service considered critical to preserving life, health, public safety, and basic societal functioning. If multi-year funding is approved, the applicant would be required to complete annual, annual reporting to the city. This addition will allow essential service providers to have greater continuity of service while being held accountable for allocated funds. Administration recommends that Council adopt the amended grants to organization policy to include multi-year funding and define eligible organizations as detailed in Appendix A. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're first. Thank you. Just some observations. Uh, I support the, the, the recommended changes. Uh, um, I like the idea of, of the multi-year funding. It, it, it streamlines their process and also um, gives them some, some assurance regarding continuity. I think those are important. Uh, and I note with interest uh, that your comment on page, our page 94, page two of your report, very top sentence where it says administration will also start offering learning opportunities for board development and organizational, organizational effectiveness. I think that's fantastic. Um, could we flesh that out and actually ask the people that, the organizations that are eligible for this type of funding get a bit of a question there on what their board development is or who they have on their board and what their skill set is and maybe actually require it if necessary. Um, could we do something like that? Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, yes, we absolutely can. We will work with organizations to find out their level of need and um, work to tailor that to support organization and board development. So did I hear you to say you're already planning to do exactly that? You're going to actually question them on, on, on their board development and try to ascertain their board inventory, so to, so to speak? Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, so the question that I had when I was reviewing this, and I know I'd mentioned it before, um, and I understand the essential, but I guess when we talk about the nonprofits, uh, there's a lot of smaller organizations. Um, should there not be a limit on how many times they can come to the well, so to speak? Otherwise, they just become a line item in the budget. Um, and, and there's no focus on them going out to try and get grant funding uh, from other places. So rather than saying, yeah, you can just apply every year, wouldn't it be better to put in a policy for some of them? Uh, if you get one year or two years, you can't apply for one or two years again because you've got to go out and find some funding somewhere else. Uh, thank you for the question, question Your Worship. Um, um, I appreciate... I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, we do want organizations to be looking for funding so that the funding that we provide through the grants to organizations it can go as far as possible within the municipality. In regards to the essential services that we're defining, we're looking at things that it would be likely if didn't exist in this community, the, we as a municipality would have to look at providing or uh, seek out supporting somebody to provide. So, um, administration feels it's in the best interest of those organizations to be able to have that continuity to plan as it is deemed a service that the that the municipality would require. Okay, and I guess my next question is going to go to Mr. Fleming. As we look at this policy and the number of applications that we get, at some point in time, should there be something within the policy that actually limits the dollar amount that that the city provides and then that needs to be spread out amongst the organizations and I ask that because like a lot of our industrial partners will have like a $25,000 grant and they'll spread it out amongst many but we just seem to have an open door policy so what are your thoughts on on council thinking about setting limits uh, yes, Your Worship. I think Mrs. Hoyer has already actually considered this point. Um, I do believe it is our intent to start to set an upper limit. I don't know that we would need to do it through the policy necessarily. It might be uh, more of a practice we set through the budget. Um, but you're right, there does need to be some kind of upper boundary and we have to make priorities within it. Um, otherwise, we just keep piling applications on top of each other and, and the amount could get quite high. So. Okay, and so my third question then, if we don't set it through a policy or something defined through budget, then doesn't it just become at the whim each year? Well, we got one more, or we got one more, so let's, you know, like... Yeah, I mean, through your worship, council does have the ability to vary from its policy anyway, so even if you put it in the policy, it, it wouldn't stop a future council from, um, from varying from that. But um, I, I would... I don't know if um, Mrs. Cowie or Mrs. Hoyer want to add to the discussions they've had on this already, but I, just my understanding at a very high level is we weren't looking at policy necessarily to create that upper upper boundary. To your worship, I would just add that in consultation with our finance department, administration did feel that it was something that could be set within our budget process rather than through policy, um, although at the discretion of council that can uh, that can go uh, through policy if required. Okay, just a question. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions, so we actually have a motion. I know this meeting's been quite different, so if I can get someone to make the motion. There's no other. Councillor Blizzard, just give me a... Go ahead. Or make it a little bigger. Uh, I'll make the motion that Council adopt the amended grants to organizations policy GEN 029 C to include multi year funding and define eligible organizations as detailed in Appendix A. Okay, thank you. Would you like to speak make to it that? A little bigger. Yeah, uh, I'll make the motion the that Council adopt the amended grants to organizations policy <laughs> GEN 029 C Sorry, to include I think, uh, that might multi year funding from and define Kelly's eligible machine, organizations as detailed oh, in Appendix Brian, A. Brian, can you put it on mute? Okay, thank you. Would you like to <laughs> speak to that? Bigger. Yeah, uh, I'll make the motion the that Council adopt Kelly, the amended can you put grants to organizations <laughs> policy <laughs> GEN 029 C to include multi year Are you on mute? Just shake your head. I was I was on mute, and I'll put it back on, but it definitely said muted. 
So it wasn't okay. So it's not Councillor Kelly. We're getting a whole back. It just repeated everything back. So okay, we'll try that again. So would you like to speak in favor? And we'll see if yes, yeah. I'm in favor of this, and I like the changes that are made. A bit of cleaning up and a bit of adding a long term um, for organizations. I think it's a good change. Okay, thank you. So it's open for discussion and debate. Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thanks. I just had one question in regards to the environmental stewardship grant. Um, do we have applicants that apply for that on a consistent basis? And is it more than one organization? Through your worship to Council Noy, and I'm going to see if there is a uh, if uh, Mr. Fleming wants to jump in, that's not an. If, if we don't have the answer yeah. now, that's fine. That's just something that came to my mind. Um, yeah. I'm trying to figure out what the echo was. I missed your question. Okay. So, through your worship to Councillor and we'll bring that information. And that's back to fine. You Through email would Thank be you. fine, even as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Anything on close? Okay. Thank you. The motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. That would be fine, even as well. Thanks. Okay. Hmm. Okay. D Are we having problem with somebody vote? There it is. Okay. The motion is carried. Thank you. All right. So, um, are there any notice of motions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Seeing no notice of motions, are there any points of interest? Not seeing any. Are there any councillor inquiries of administration? Councillor Kelly? Yes, thank you. Um, this goes to Troy. When I look at the rec indoor rec survey, um, the conclusions, Troy, that are written are written as though the conclusions and the data applies to the entire community, which is different than, I point out, the slides that the presenter used to present to council. Um, I think this policy this report should be updated to be factual, and I think it's significantly misleading as it's written. I know I haven't given you much time. What I'm going to ask of you, please, is to give it some thought of, of an approach that could be taken to get this thing better worded and, and more appropriately worded, and maybe send council an email on your thoughts um, when you have a chance in the ne over the course of the next week. I'm very, personally, I'm very reluctant to have this thing sit on our website the way it is worded. Um, any comments and does that make sense? I'm, uh, before Mr. Fleming makes a comment, I'm just going to uh, suggest that if that's a direction of, of one individual to Mr. Fleming, um, you have to remember a majority of council would have to uh, endorse a resolution to have him bring back something different. So if you did decide to do that, you would have to bring a notice of motion forward. What I'm asking at this particular juncture, Mayor Catcher, is simply for Mr. Fleming to give it some thought and offer comments back to council. And at that particular time, might, maybe council does have to make a motion. And if in fact you want me to make a notice of motion, I will do that. And this thing can sit on the website until I get it changed and I'm convinced that council will see the see that it should be changed. So it's up to you. I'm just simply asking administration to do something right now, give something some consideration. Up to you how you Mr. Fleming, any comments? Uh, yeah, through your worship, I, I actually um, sent a message here a few minutes ago and uh, gave some direction um, that there there is some cleanup in the language um, in terms of how we describe the um, the response set that we did get. So um, to say that it's representative of all, of all households, it would probably be more accurate to say it's representative of all households that took the opportunity to respond. 
Um, so there's a few cleanups in terms of how we describe what this data is that I, I had already directed that could be done and uh, we could post. And I don't think it doesn't change the statistics. It just, it, it or what we did, but it changes how we're describing uh, what it is. And I don't think it was going to be a lot. So that's why I just directed that it be done. Thank you, Troy. Um, could you ensure that council gets a copy of the revised version as soon as it's available? Uh, yes, do worship. We'll make sure that it's widely shared. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other inquiries to administration? If not, I require a motion to go in camera. Councillor Noyan, did you want to do that one? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll move that uh, council enter closed session and for discussion of matters under FOIP. Thank you. Close the motion. Please cast your vote. And that is carried. So we will move into closed session. Thank you.